Chapter 21, Elisha's Closing Ministry Called to the prophetic office while Ahab was still reigning, Elisha had lived to see many changes take place in the kingdom of Israel. Judgment upon judgment had befallen the Israelites during the reign of Hazael the Syrian, who had been anointed to be the scourge of the apostate nation. The stern measures of reform instituted by Jehu had resulted in the slaying of all the house of Ahab. In continued wars with the Syrians, Jehoahaz, Jehu's successor, had lost some of the cities lying east of the Jordan. For a time, it had seemed as if the Syrians might gain control of the entire kingdom. But the Reformation begun by Elijah and carried forward by Elisha had led many to inquire after God. The altars of Baal were being forsaken, and slowly yet surely, God's purpose was being fulfilled in the lives of those who chose to serve him with all the heart. It was because of his love for erring Israel that God permitted the Syrians to scourge them. It was because of his compassion for those whose moral power was weak that he raised up Jehu to slay wicked Jezebel and all the house of Ahab. Once more, through a merciful providence, the priests of Baal and of Ashtoreth were set aside and their heathen altars thrown down. God in his wisdom foresaw that if temptation were removed, some would forsake heathenism and turn their faces heavenward, and this is why he permitted calamity after calamity to befall them. His judgments were tempered with mercy, and when his purpose was accomplished, he turned the tide in favor of those who had learned to inquire after him. While influences for good and for evil were striving for the ascendancy, and Satan was doing all in his power to complete the ruin he had wrought during the reign of Ahab and Jezebel, Elisha continued to bear his testimony. He met with opposition, yet none could gainsay his words. Throughout the kingdom he was honored and venerated. Many came to him for counsel. While Jezebel was still living, Joram, the king of Israel, sought his advice, and once when in Damascus, he was visited by messengers from Ben-Hadad, king of Syria, who desired to learn whether a sickness then upon him would result in death. To all, the prophet bore faithful witness in a time when, on every hand, truth was being perverted and the great majority of the people were in open rebellion against heaven. And God never forsook his chosen messenger. On one occasion, during a Syrian invasion, the king of Syria sought to destroy Elisha because of his activity in apprising the king of Israel of the plans of the enemy. The Syrian king had taken counsel with his servants, saying, in such in such a place shall be my camp. This plan was revealed by the Lord to Elisha, who sent unto the king of Israel, saying, Beware that thou pass not such a place, for thither the Syrians are come down. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of, and saved himself there, not once nor twice. Therefore the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. Determined to make a way with the prophet, the Syrian king commanded, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. The prophet was in Dothan, and, learning this, the king sent thither horses and chariots and a great host, and they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, a host 
compassed the city both with horses and chariots. In terror, Elisha's servant sought him with the tidings. Alas, my master, he said, how shall we do? Fear not, was the answer of the prophet, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And then, that the servant might know this for himself, Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. The Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw, and behold, The mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Between the servant of God and the hosts of armed foemen was an encircling band of heavenly angels. They had come down in mighty power, not to destroy, not to exact homage, but to encamp round about and minister to the Lord's weak and helpless ones. When the people of God are brought into straight places and apparently there is no escape for them, the Lord alone must be their dependence. As the company of Syrian soldiers boldly advanced, ignorant of the unseen hosts of heaven, Elisha prayed unto the Lord and said, Smite this people, I pray thee, with blindness. And he smote them with blindness according to the word of Elisha. And Elisha said unto them, This is not the way, neither is this the city. Follow me, and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. But he led them to Samaria. And it came to pass, when they were come into Samaria, that Elisha said, Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. And the Lord opened their eyes and they saw, and behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. And the king of Israel said unto Elisha, when he saw them, My father, shall I smite them? Shall I smite them? And he answered, Thou shalt not smite them, Wouldest thou smite those whom thou hast taken captive with thy sword and with thy bow? Set bread and water before them that they may eat and drink, and go to their master. And he prepared great provision for them. And when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away, and they went to their master. See Second Kings chapter 6. For a time after this, Israel was free from the attacks of the Syrians. But later, under the energetic direction of a determined king, Hazael, the Syrian hosts surrounded Samaria and besieged it. Never had Israel been brought into so great a strait as during this siege. The sins of the fathers were indeed being visited upon the children and the children's children. The horrors of prolonged famine were driving the king of Israel to desperate measures when Elisha predicted deliverance the following day. As the next morning was about to dawn, the Lord made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they, seized with fear, arose and fled in the twilight, leaving their tents and their horses and their asses even the camp as it was, with rich stores of food. They fled for their life, not tarrying until after the Jordan had been crossed. During the night of flight, four leprous men at the gate of the city, made desperate by hunger, had proposed to visit the Syrian camp and throw themselves upon the mercy of the besiegers, hoping thereby to arouse sympathy and obtain food. What was their astonishment when, entering the camp, they found no man there? With none to molest or forbid, they went into one tent and did eat and drink, and carried thence silver and gold and raiment, and went and hid it, and came again and entered into another tent, and carried thence also, and went and hid it. Then they said one to another, We do not well, This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. Quickly they returned to the city with the glad news. 
Great was the spoil, so abundant were the supplies that on that day a measure of fine flour was sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel, as had been foretold by Elisha the day before. Once more, the name of God was exalted before the heathen, according to the word of the Lord through his prophet in Israel. See 2 Kings 7, verses 5 to 16. Thus the man of God continued to labor from year to year, drawing close to the people in faithful ministry and in times of crisis, standing by the side of kings as a wise counselor. The long years of idolatrous backsliding on the part of rulers and people had wrought their baleful work. The dark shadow of apostasy was still everywhere apparent, yet here and there were those who had steadfastly refused to bow the knee to Baal. As Elisha continued his work of reform, many were reclaimed from heathenism, and these learned to rejoice in the service of the true God. The prophet was cheered by these miracles of divine grace, and he was inspired with a great longing to reach all who were honest in heart. Wherever he was, he endeavored to be a teacher of righteousness. From a human point of view, the outlook for the spiritual regeneration of the nation was as hopeless as is the outlook today before God's servants who are laboring in the dark places of the earth. But the Church of Christ is God's agency for the proclamation of truth. She is empowered by Him to do a special work, and if she is loyal to God, obedient to His commandments, there will dwell within her the excellency of divine power. If she will be true to her allegiance, there is no power that can stand against her. The forces of the enemy will be no more able to overwhelm her than is the chaff to resist the whirlwind. There is before the church the dawn of a bright, glorious day if she will put on the robe of Christ's righteousness, withdrawing from all allegiance to the world. God calls upon his faithful ones who believe in him to talk courage to those who are unbelieving and hopeless. Turn to the Lord, ye prisoners of hope. Seek strength from God, the living God. Show an unwavering, humble faith in his power and his willingness to save. When in faith we take hold of his strength, he will change, wonderfully change, the most hopeless, discouraging outlook. He will do this for the glory of his name. So long as Elisha was able to journey from place to place throughout the kingdom of Israel, he continued to take an active interest in the upbuilding of the schools of the prophets. Wherever he was, God was with him, giving him words to speak and power to work miracles. On one occasion, the sons of the prophets said unto Elisha, Behold now the place where we dwell with thee is too straight for us. Let us go, we pray thee, unto Jordan, and take thence every man a beam, and let us make us a place there where we may dwell. Second Kings 6, verses 1 and 2. Elisha went with them to Jordan, encouraging them by his presence, giving them instruction, and even performing a miracle to aid them in their work. As one was felling a beam, the axe head fell into the water, and he cried and said, Alas, master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where fell it? And he showed him the place. And he cut down a stick and cast it in thither, and the iron did swim. Therefore said he, Take it up to thee. And he put out his hand and took it. Verses 5-7 to seven. So effectual had been his ministry, and so widespread his influence, that as he lay upon his deathbed, even the youthful king Joash, an idolater with but little respect for God, recognized in the prophet a father in Israel, 
and acknowledged that his presence among them was of more value in time of trouble than the possession of an army of horses and chariots. The record reads, Now Elisha was fallen sick, of his sickness whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him, and wept over his face, and said, O my father, my father, the chariot of Israel, and the horsemen thereof. 2 Kings 13, verse 14. To many a troubled soul in need of help, the prophet had acted the part of a wise, sympathetic father. And in this instance, he turned not from the godless youth before him, so unworthy of the position of trust he was occupying, and yet so greatly in need of counsel. God in his providence was bringing to the king an opportunity to redeem the failures of the past and to place his kingdom on vantage ground. The Syrian foe, now occupying the territory east of the Jordan, was to be repulsed. Once more the power of God was to be manifested in behalf of erring Israel. The dying prophet bade the king, Take bow and arrows. Joash obeyed. Then the prophet said, Put thine hand upon the bow. Joash put his hand upon it, and Elisha put his hands upon the king's hands. And he said, Open the window eastward, toward the cities beyond the Jordan, in possession of the Syrians. The king, having opened the latticed window, Elisha bade him shoot. As the arrow sped on its way, the prophet was inspired to say, The arrow of the Lord's deliverance, and the arrow of deliverance from Syria, for thou shalt smite the Syrians in Aphek, till thou have consumed them. And now the prophet tested the faith of the king. Bidding Joash take up the arrows, he said, Smite upon the ground. Thrice the king smote the ground, and then he stayed his hand. Thou shouldest have smitten five or six times, Elisha exclaimed in dismay. Then hadst thou smitten Syria till thou hadst consumed it, whereas now thou shalt smite Syria but thrice. Second Kings 13, verses 15 to 19. The lesson is for all in positions of trust. When God opens the way for the accomplishment of a certain work and gives assurance of success, the chosen instrumentality must do all in his power to bring about the promised result. In proportion to the enthusiasm and perseverance with which the work is carried forward will be the success given. God can work miracles for his people only as they act their part with untiring energy. He calls for men of devotion to his work, men of moral courage, with ardent love for souls, and with a zeal that never flags. Such workers will find no task too arduous, no prospect too hopeless. They will labor on, undaunted, until apparent defeat is turned into glorious victory. Not even prison walls, nor the martyr's stake beyond, will cause them to swerve from their purpose of laboring together with God for the upbuilding of His kingdom. With the counsel and encouragement given Joash, the work of Elisha closed. He upon whom had fallen in full measure the spirit resting upon Elijah had proved faithful to the end. Never had he wavered. Never had he lost his trust in the power of omnipotence. Always, when the way before him seemed utterly closed, he had still advanced by faith, and God had honored his confidence and opened the way before him. It was not given Elisha to follow his master in a fiery chariot. Upon him the Lord permitted to come a lingering illness. During the long hours of human weakness and suffering, his faith laid fast hold on the promises of God, and he beheld ever about him heavenly messengers of comfort and peace. 
as on the heights of Dothan he had seen the encircling hosts of heaven, the fiery chariots of Israel and the horsemen thereof. So now he was conscious of the presence of sympathizing angels, and he was sustained. Throughout his life he had exercised strong faith, and as he had advanced in a knowledge of God's providences and of his merciful kindness, faith had ripened into an abiding trust in his God, and when death called him, he was ready to rest from his labors. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Psalm 116, verse 15. The righteous hath hope in his death. Proverbs 14, verse 32. With the psalmist, Elisha could say in all confidence, God will redeem my soul from the power of the grave, for he shall receive me. Psalm 49, verse 15. And with rejoicing he could testify, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. Job 19, verse 25. As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied when I awake with thy likeness. Psalm 17, verse 15.